My name is Lou Gelati. My Italian grandparents came to America in 1895, and as the saying goes, I got to Texas as fast as I could. As a Texan, I've worked hard to become a successful businessman, race car driver, and aspiring congressman. I live for God, country, and family, and I believe in fast cars, big guns, and the pursuit of happiness. I am a patriot, and this is my story, Cars and Country. You know, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, I hitchhiked down to Watkins Glen, jumped the fence, and watched uh, my first Formula One race. And I'm pretty sure I, I became addicted right then. I, I couldn't see any difference in the way those drivers looked from anybody else. They had two arms and two legs, and I was sure that if they could do it, I could do it. Bobby, Bobby, hey Mike, how are we coming on that car? Three days left. We're doing the cam job first. We're gonna dyno it and see what our cam and our headers does compared to a stock car. And then we're, after we get that done, then we're gonna come back and put a supercharger on it. All together, I think we're gonna pick up somewhere around 140 horsepower over stock which will bring this up pretty close to 600 horsepower. We have three more days, four if we count Saturday. We have no choice. This car's got to be in the trailer, on the road Tuesday night. So, uh, and we're heading to the Bowling Green Corvette Museum. We're going to do some uh, hot laps with this car and uh, do some celebrity drives with the patrons of the Corvette Museum. There'll be 1,200 Corvette uh, owners that'll be at this, uh, this event, maybe more. It might be 2,000. I mean, it's a huge event at the Corvette Museum. And uh, every one of those people will get to walk through the museum and they'll see our LG Motorsports race car. So to me, that's an honor. You know, that old saying where if you do something that you love and you make a living at it, you don't have to work another day in your life. Well, that's true. And here I am in Dallas, Texas, in our brand new um, LG Motorsports building, 45,000 square foot building. That's over an acre under one roof. And this is our new headquarters. We build race cars here, we build parts here, uh, we install the parts we build, uh, it's turned into a huge business and uh, we couldn't be more proud and it's all happened because of racing. The schedule right now is I've got to have everything done, truck decal, car decal, car done, everything dyno tested in the trailer, has to be ready to leave Tuesday morning. A little bit of a tight schedule right now considering we haven't got the first part of the car done but at least the suspension and the brakes are tested, it's just all engine stuff at this point. Anyway, we're going to be gone all those days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Okay, then the truck leaves on Tuesday. The truck leaves on Tuesday night at midnight. The challenges right now is not only are we getting the car ready to go, but we're also doing R&D and development along with it. So we've got new cooling packages that we're developing along with this. We've got a new radiator that's going in. It's going to get tested for the first time. We've got some transmission cooling upgrades for the car. Again, tested for the first time. We always get it done. <laughs> It may, it may start the, the morning of and run on the dyno and go right in the trailer, but we always get it done. We've done it before and I'm sure this won't be the last time we're under the pressure a little bit. Okay. At my age, the knowledge, the accumulated knowledge of 40 years of racing cars, we implement. We take that and we implement it and we, we inject it into the cars we work on now. When I was a kid, watching Todd and Buzz on the TV show Route 66, we all wanted to have a Corvette. Now we make some of the best Corvettes in the country and uh, we make some of the best parts for a Corvette in the country. More fun than I should be allowed to have, I've said that before. Well, how did I get started in racing? I started with a, a Triumph TR3. I bought it really off a, a dealer's front lot for 
for $600 and then I tore it apart and it was my first experience and I turned it into probably one of the fastest Triumph TR3s ever. And uh, we made it to the national championship runoffs my second year. That's where a sponsor, a man named Barry Budlong, a businessman from Rochester, New York, decided that he wanted to sponsor me and Barry took me into pro racing. In 1974, we went to our first pro race up at uh, Mossport up in Canada. And at that race, that's a really tough track. Uh, the locals were telling me, don't worry. You know, it's a tough track. Don't feel bad if you don't do well. And it was a Formula One weekend and I put the car on the pole and it was a bull of a pro series and we were uh, pretty much stuck on racing pro racing from then on. This is part of the ritual. You start realizing you're going on the racetrack and you're going to be going 150 or 60 miles an hour. So you got to get your brain in gear as well as your car in gear. We have with us a real race car driver. I'm just a pretend one. We have Lou Gelati, who I'm sure most of you know. If you don't, he's a resident real race car driver in the club. And he wants to say a few words to you guys while we have your attention. Well, I was telling Jack, uh, you know, my name's Lou Gelati. I've been pro racing uh, for 40 years. Um, when Jack built this racetrack in the mid 90s, we had no place to test. We would go out to Big Springs. There was an airport out there. And we would go out and rent Big, Big Springs for $1,500 a day. It was terrible. Um, when Jack built this track, we walked around here in the mid-90s, I'm not sure the exact year, 96 or 7, and it was just lime-stabilized dirt. He had just carved out the track. I begged him to get rid of this part, but he didn't, he didn't listen to me. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but this has been a godsend because now every car we build, every car we race, we build race cars, we, we've been racing race cars. Everything we do, we have, our baseline is right on this track. So we know exactly what we have to do each car, if we make a change to the car, what, is, what it did, what it has to do, was it an improvement, did it, did, it, did it help us or hurt us? It's turned into a godsend for us. And we're here at the uh, Corvette Museum, uh, at the grand opening of their new racetrack and the 20th anniversary of the museum. And we're here because we have one of our cars, our um, 2008 American Le Mans cars. It's really a piece of history. It was the first American Le Mans GT2 car that was ever built. Uh, it's the only independently run Corvette that ever out qualified the factory Corvette team. The other thing um, that we're doing is we're giving hot laps. We're going to give the hot laps. Uh, people are signing up and the money goes to charity and then they get to ride with me you know, for 15 minutes in the car. That's a good cause and how does it get any better? More fun than anybody should be allowed to have and the money goes to charity. How does it get better than that? My sponsor took me to Mindy Indy Cars. There was a Bosch VW Gold Cup. Uh, I raced Chiraco Bilstein Cup. And uh, all this was in the 70s. It got to a point where my sponsor, he just, he just um, decided he had spent enough money. We know there's money in racing because we put it there. Uh, that's what my sponsor used to say. So um, in 1978, I had to make a decision. How was I gonna race if I didn't have a sponsor? So I contacted the company in Indianapolis that built this mini IndyCar, and I worked out a deal where I would go and work for a month for them during the day without getting paid, and then at night I could use their facility and I could build my own parts and my own race car. And I did that two years in a row. I literally slept in their barn uh, for 30 days. Yes, he had mercy on me, let me uh, come in and use his shower, and uh, he ended up eventually feeding me, I think, the last week. Uh, I was so broke, uh, it was just, it was hard to believe that that racing could be such an addiction, but it, it is the last clean, wholesome fun left in America. And that was the beginning of, uh, of, of how I had figured out that if you're gonna race, you're either gonna have to be very wealthy or you're gonna have to sacrifice. 
and I quit racing in 79 for a couple of years, um, just long enough to meet my wife and get married and uh, have a couple of great kids. And uh, my wife and I, we've been married now for 33 years. My wife says every day has been an adventure because uh, we came to Texas 30 years ago with no money. And I love to say the harder we work, the luckier we get because nothing comes easy, nothing is free. I tell my kids, you know, shoot for the stars because even if you miss, you're going to hit the moon. Not to mention that uh, for the first part of this year, I ran for Congress. I ran against an incumbent, very nice man, he just stayed a little bit too long. You can't have uh, anyone in office for 34 years, I don't care who he is. Um, and, and this is supposed to be a government of the people. The common man was supposed to be able to run for Congress and be a congressman. I'm a hardcore patriot. That's what this whole TV show is about, cars and country. You know, we, I love America, I love cars, they coexist, and I'm afraid that at some point, some regulation is gonna come out and they're gonna say, okay, no more gasoline. Uh, we're never gonna produce another drop of gasoline and so you can't have a gasoline car. And then they'll start with diesel. Or at some point, um, our way of life is gonna be changed and it's gonna be changed by government without the consent of the governed. And it's gonna be done, as they say, for your own good. We're from the government and we're here to help you. It's for your own good. Well, it's not. The American people are smart enough to do everything they need to do for themselves. In the old days, they would say only in America, you know, and now they say only in Texas because there's really some tremendous opportunities in Texas. When I ran for Congress and I was off giving speeches almost four times, five times a week, um, I was lucky I had the people working for me that I did or I would have never been able to do that. So I don't have to manage Bobby and Anthony very much. My, my technicians, we give them a job, they just get it done. They know what they have to do, they get it done, they do a great job. We've accomplished quite a bit and I like I tell, love to tell people, 30 years ago I borrowed $1,200 from Beneficial Finance to make it to Texas. But we're fortunate to be here, we have uh, great Corvette and Camaro customers. Uh, we design and build a lot of parts, the list goes on and on. Anyway, God bless America, God bless Texas. I look forward to staying in Texas, living and dying in Texas, because this is the place I love. God bless America. But in 1988, the racing and the business collided. 88 was the Corvette Challenge. The promoter of the series, John Powell from Canada, he offered to give me a car to use, and my prize money would go toward paying off the car. And if I didn't win enough prize money at the end of the year, I had to make up the difference and buy the rest of the car, which I didn't have any money, or if I won enough money, I would get the title of the car. And uh, it turned out at the awards banquet, I got the title of the car and $20,000 check. So I, now I had a $20,000, I had a, a, a Corvette race car. I took it right to the auction, sold it for $30,000, and came back with the $50,000 I had. We just pumped it into my company and we just started building my company up little by little. And here we are um, doing what we do best. We build performance parts for Corvettes and Camaros. And, and to think when I jumped the fence in 1964 uh, for my first Formula One race, that I would ever stay in the racing industry and the, and the performance parts industry, building race cars and building this sort of thing. You can't wake up in the morning and dream that and say, I think I'll do this for a living. And then usually one day a week, I go out and shoot my guns. I have more guns than I ever dreamed I would have. I have an AR-10, AR-15, I have a Lapua 338. At any rate, I'm a hardcore patriot. Awesome. Throw within this much. Whoa. Huh? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so we got 10 shots from 300 yards all on the paper, all within the, uh, the inner two circles. This is Sergio. He got 10 in, on the paper seven inside the two circles. Today was a good day. We, uh, we shot our pistols, we shot our, all of our rifles. We verified that the Lapool will go through a four inch solid railroad tie. 
uh, hits a tree and then it hits a dirt embankment beyond here. So I pity the guy laying on the dirt embankment. This is our Second Amendment day and uh, it's uh, a good day. I've been playing piano since I was five years old. Uh, never took lessons, but we always had a piano. I play piano every day because my life is really cluttered. I have my business, my racing, my parts, developing parts between my business and everything we do. Um, the piano, for an hour a day, allows me to forget all that. This is pork first. You gotta get a brown the pork. This is a Mama Gelati, uh, my mother's recipe. I grew up on this. My mother would make a, a pot about this big and uh, it would last us a whole week. And uh, it would be our Sunday dinner and then at least two times during the week and, and uh, Saturdays for snacks. My mother would be proud of me. She died about eight years ago. My dad died when I was 20 years old, 22 years old, of cancer way back then. In fact, it was my senior year when my dad passed away, so um, when he died, we literally had to, had to find $1,500 to bury him, and uh, you know, he had the GI Bill, my mother, uh, you know, my mother was then alone, so uh, it was up to me and my uh, other brother and sister. They, uh, we had to make sure that the, the things were okay for it. And uh, you know, that's what that's what kids are supposed to do. My dad and my grandfather were both policemen. And so uh, I, if I did something wrong, they would bring me home to my dad. I'd be in deep trouble. Usually when I did something wrong, it had to do with a car. And so um, that was always pretty funny. Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. You know, I smile a lot. I joke a lot. People say, why? I said, I mean, I'm a car nut. How can I complain? Life is great. I've been able to pursue happiness, and we would like to share that love for cars and speed and uh, the feeling, the adrenaline that comes with it. I tell everybody, racing is the last clean, wholesome fun left in America. Yeah, we've had to pay our taxes. Yeah, we've had to go through a lot of government regulations. But I'm telling you, America is still the greatest country on earth. At any rate, that's what my day is. My day is inventing new parts, coming up with new innovative products, trying to enjoy my life a little bit. I have more fun than anybody should be allowed to have.